at capital X. This left triangle little x is equal to <laughs> zero if little x is less than zero. It's one minus p if zero is less than or equal to x is less than one. And it's 1 if x is bigger than or equal to 1. That function looks like this. but not including the value x equals 0. It jumps to 1 minus p at 0. It stays there until you get to 1. Then it jumps to 1 and stays there. And from this graph, you can read out the following pieces of information. The probability that capital X is 0. is the jump at 0. And the jump at 0 is 1 minus p. The probability that x is 1 is the jump at 1. And that's size p. <coughs> now to see why this is true, um, this captures every aspect that you need to know about discrete random variables. Discrete random variables are ones that have this feature. They have jumps. And between the jumps, they're flat. Those are called discrete random variables. If you look at this function here, and you have y less than x, then f of x minus f of y would be the probability that little y is strictly less than capital X is less than or equal to little x. Okay. okay. So x is a uh, function on this two-point space. How many values can x take on if it's a function? It can, how many va uh, values can it take on at s? Only one and at f only one. So x can only have two values. Um, if I put, um, and what could those two values be? Well, um, if I put some number here bigger than 0 and some number here less than 0, for example, if I draw a picture like this, what's this probability in this case? Well, it's f at x minus f of y. We did this on Friday. Okay. Uh, what's f at x? 1 minus p. What's f of y? It's 0. And does it matter how close x and y are to 0? Well, a little bit. x can't be over here. But as long as x is near 0 to the right of it and y is near 0 to the left of it, this will be 1 minus p. And if I let x and y collapse down, what do we conclude about the value of x at, what, what do we conclude about the probability that x is equal to 0? That it's, well, what does this interval can collapse to when x goes to 0 and y goes to 0? Collapse to the point 0. So where could x be? It has only two possible values. One of them is going to be 0, and the probability of being 0 is 1, is, one minus p. On the other hand, if I put x over here and y there, 
But would f of x minus f of y equal? It, well, f of x is 1. f of y is 1 minus p. 1 minus 1 minus p is p. So this would be the jump here, which would be p. And I can let x and y get arbitrarily close to 1. And that would mean that probably x is 1 is p. Now, to review, um, Bernoulli random variables led to a whole bunch of other ones. In fact, probably all, almost all the ones you'll study that are discrete are coming from Bernoulli random variables. Any question on this Bernoulli random variable and its distribution function? Okay. I guess there's one last thing to say, the probability mass function Otherwise, the probability x is equal to a value little x is 0. And when you don't assign the values to a probability mass function, it's assumed that they're 0. And we'll use an abbreviation for a probability mass function, PMF. Okay, so a Bernoulli random variable is a random variable that assigns value x to success, I'm sorry, 1 to success, 0 to failure. Uh, binomial random variable, you do n trials, which are Bernoulli. These aren't all equally likely, but the probability, and so what you do here is x of a, an outcome is the number of s's in the outcome. So each of these sequences of s's and f's, you can count, in each one you count the number of successes, that's x. And the probability of any outcome is the following. It's p to the number of s or p to the um, yeah, number of s's in omega. And then 1 minus p to the number of f's in omega. Okay, so omega would be a sequence of s's and f's. And we put a probability measure on this sample space, which assigns this amount, this probability, to omega. If omega has k, say k s's and n minus k failures, this would be p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. Uh, and then here, a binomial random variable with parameter n and p.
which we'll abbreviate binomial NP as property that the probability that x is equal to k is p to the k, 1 minus p to the n minus k. So a binomial random variable has interpretation. It's the number of successes in n independent trials of a n independent Bernoulli trials. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot something here. Times n choose k. Bernoulli also led to geometric. Perform independent Bernoulli trials, that is, you perform an experiment that has two outcomes, success and failure. Probably success is P, probably failure is 1 minus P. You perform that until the first success happens. That random variable is called a geometric random variable. And last time we said that uh, probably that uh, X is K for this random variable is uh, 1 minus P to the k minus 1, and then times p, and this is for k equal 1, 2, etc. So this is the probability mass function for a geometric random variable. The distribution function here, the probability capital X is, uh, let's say, bigger than, or less than or equal to k, would be the sum j equal 1 to k, 1 minus p to the j minus 1 times p. Okay, Get the distribution function from the probability mass function by adding. Okay. Bernoulli also led to Poisson. Perform n independent trials, but the probability of success depends on n. And I gave some biological examples, also the example of emission of alpha particles from a blob of radioactive substance. Then the probability that x is equal to k is approximately equal to lambda to the k over k factorial e to the minus lambda. And a random variable with this PMF is called Poisson. And then finally, Bernoulli led to central uh, to uh, 
a normal distribution. So uh, Then the probability x over root n is less than equal to number little x is approximately given by this distribution function. And this is the distribution function for a normal random variable with mean 0 and variance 1. So Bernoulli led to all these different um, random variables and, or distributions. We'll study all of them. We spent some time on discrete. Let's spend a little time on uh, continuous. I would like to do one computation with the geometric before going on to continuous, though. Continuous means that the distribution function of the random variable it has no jumps. That's what continuous random variable means. So again, here I'm taking x to be geometric. OK, so when I say that, I don't say what the value of x is. I say something about the statistical properties or probabilistic properties of x. And the only probabilistic information we have about x would be its PMF or equivalently its distribution function. So when I say x is a geometric random variable, I'm saying its distribution function is this. Okay? Whenever I identify a random variable, x is something like normal. I'm saying what the distribution function is. If I say x is Bernoulli, I'm saying what the distribution function is. Okay? So here I'm saying x is a geometric random variable. With, and I should say what the parameters are. That means. If I want to know what the probability that x is smaller than or equal to some, some value k, it's equal to this. Okay? That's the information we're given. Now I want to do a conditional probability. I want to compute the probability that what? What's the interpretation of x again? It's a trial on which the first success appears. So it's like uh, if p is a 6, this is the same as rolling a die until the first one appears. And the number of rolls it takes, the, number of ro the numbered roll on which the first one appeared, that's the value x. So what's the probability that the first success occurs after this trial? given that it didn't occur in the first n minus 1 trials. So what's the probability that the success, success doesn't occur in the first n plus k minus trials, k minus 1 trials, given that it did not occur in the first n minus 1 trials? Do you, does everyone understand why what I'm saying is contained in this line here? X is the trial in which the first success occurs. It says you've been trying whatever you're trying, like rolling a die or tossing a coin, waiting for success. You've done it n minus 1 times, and you didn't succeed. What's the probability that if you do it k more times, you still don't succeed? That's what this probability is. Okay. 
Now, do you recall the definition of conditional probability? Probability of A given B. These are two events. This is an event. That's an event. So we look at the probability of A given B. Remember, that's the probability of A intersected with B divided by the probability of B. All right? So we do that here. Here's the event A. This is the event B. What does this become? So this comma means both things happen. Okay. Now one of those inequalities is stricter than the other in the numerator. Which one is stricter, or which one gives a smaller event? Right. Yeah, because if x is bigger than this, it's automatically bigger than that. We're taking k to be 1, 2, 3, etc. So that means I can just do what? Get rid of it. Cross that out. It doesn't add anymore to the event. All right, so now let's compute. What's the probability? Can we compute the probability that x is bigger than something? We know the probability that x is smaller than something, smaller than or equal to. A distribution function has this form. What if you wanted to compute that? Right, it's 1 minus f of x. It's just the thing that I told you before. The probability of a complement is 1 minus the probability of a. a here is this event, x less than or equal to little x. What's a complement then? x bigger than little x. So here's a complement. This would be the probability of a. Okay? So we can compute these things because what? We know the distribution function. So how would we turn this around? What would uh, 1 minus, this is f of k here. What's 1 minus f of k in that case? Well, what happens when I add this up? j equal 1 to infinity, I get f of infinity, which is 1. 1 minus f of k would be the sum k plus 1 to infinity. Let me do it this way. Sum, this one is the sum j equals 0 to infinity, 1 minus p to the j minus 1 times p. This one is the sum j equals 0 to k, 1 minus p to the j minus 1 times p. Does everybody agree with this? I did this last time. Why is this, why is this 1? Because you can take the p out, you can rearrange the yeah. indices, and that sum is 1 over 1 minus. 1 minus p. Right, this is a geometric series here. Oops, I'm sorry, this should be one here, sorry. That's one, I did start at the wrong place here. One, one, one. Did I start at the right place here? Yeah, I did it right. Okay. Or another way to say it is this is f of infinity and the distribution function at infinity is always equal to one. So what would we have if we subtract this from this? Well, we'd have the terms from k plus one to infinity, right? Okay, so can you say anything more specific about that? Can we evaluate that? 
Can we, well, what do I mean? Can we make it simpler? Can we express it without using an infinite series? Well, there's a factor that's multiplied times every term here, of p, right? And that doesn't depend on j, so I can pull that out. And what do we know about series that look like this? We do know the sum j equals 0 to infinity, r to the j is 1 over 1 minus r, as long as absolute r is less than 1. And here we have 1 minus p. p is the number between 0 and 1, so absolute 1 minus p is less than 1. Now, the difference between this and this is what? Well, I guess one difference is here's a j, and there's a j minus 1. But I don't think that's a big obstacle. We could just change variables, right? So let's do that first. Well, maybe we do that second. What's, that? What's the other difference? Here we start at k plus 1. Here we start at 0. So we'd like to start at uh, 0 and have a j there. So maybe, um, what can we do? Can we t t t factor out? What's the first term here? If j is k plus 1, what appears here? If j is k plus 1, what appears here? K, right? If this is k plus 1. k plus 1 minus 1 is k. So the first term here is 1 minus p to the k. And all the others will have higher powers of 1 minus p. So why don't we factor out 1 minus p to the k? It'll occur in every term. So p, 1 minus p to the k, sum, j equals something to infinity, uh, 1 minus p to the what? Well, now that we've taken out the 1 minus p to the k, we start with what? Well, 1 minus p to the k was here. We pulled it out. So what's left for the first term? When k is, when j is k plus 1, we factor out 1 minus p. This becomes 1. What's the next term? We put k plus 2, we get 1 minus p to the 1, 1, right? What's the next one? When k plus 3, we get 1 minus p squared, so we get 1 minus p to the 0, plus 1 minus p to the first, plus 1 minus p squared, plus 1 minus p cubed. In other words, we get some j equals 0 to infinity, 1 minus p to the j, wouldn't we? And this, we can evaluate using that. So we get p times 1 minus p to the k times 1 over 1 minus 1 minus p. And 1 minus 1 minus p is p. And here's a p. So this and this cancel, leaving 1 minus p to the k. So let's summarize. What did we just do? <laughs> the probability that x is bigger than k for a geometric random variable with parameter p is 1 minus p to the k. All right, so what did we want to compute? We wanted to compute this ratio. Can we do it? Yes, we can. We know what things like this look like and what things like that look like, so let's evaluate that. Here we get 1 minus p to what power? And here we get 1 minus p to the minus. And this is 1 minus p to the k. 
which was the probability you have to wait k trials. Or you are, let me be a little more careful. It's the probability that you don't get a success in the first k trials. So the probability you have to wait k more trials, even after you've gone, even after you've gone n minus 1 trials, is the same as though you're starting from the beginning. So if you're uh, rolling a die and you've done it a thousand times and you get a one, you didn't get a one, uh, does it mean that you're due? That you should be more likely to get a one next or in the next few trials? No, you're not due. <laughs> it's just like you're starting again as though you haven't rolled a die at all. Okay. Sometimes you hear people say that in the lottery some numbers are going to be hot. Because why? Well, they haven't appeared for a while. Well, does that mean they're going to appear soon? No. Okay. So keep this lesson in mind. If you forget everything else, remember this. Okay. okay. And does it make sense to you? Yeah. Why? The coin or die or whatever you're doing with is a, an object with no memory, no way of controlling outcomes, just a, a stupid object, right? Okay, so now let's go to continuous random variables again. I think I did a, maybe I didn't like it. Continuous, I should try to spell it right. So it means that the distribution function is a continuous function of x. The distribution functions I did earlier were all had flat spots interspersed, I mean, jumps interspersed with flat spots. Okay, here there's continuous increase. Though they can, these functions can have flat spots, but no jumps. Okay. We did one last time, uniform random variable. A very important one is called the exponential random variable with parameter lambda. more careful. Okay. X cannot take on negative values. The probability capital X is negative is zero. The probability that less or equal to X is like this. Um, if this is the case, the probability that capital X is bigger than little x equal? Well, what's the complement of this event? It, it'd be one minus, this is the complement of this event, right? Capital X bigger than little x is the complement of capital X less than or equal to little x. So this probability is one minus that probability. What's one minus this probability? E to the minus 
right, e to the minus lambda x. So the probability dies off exponentially fast as little x goes to infinity. Okay. Now, um, sometimes these functions are differentiable. In this case, it is. What's the derivative of this function? It would be lambda e to the minus lambda x for x positive and 0 for x negative. And at 0, it's not differentiable. Uh, no. But we call this, um, we usually give the no notation little f, and that's called the density. And what's the relation between a function and its derivative that is given by the integral calculus? Do you remember the fundamental theorem of calculus? If you integrate the derivative of a function, what do you get? You get the function back again, right? prime is little f, then the integral of little f from y to x gives f of cap, f at x minus f of y. And if these are distribution functions, then this would be that. Okay. So keep this formula in mind. If you want to know the probab probability like this, if you know the distribution functions, you just take the difference of the distribution functions. If you know the density, you integrate the density from y to x. Okay. So um, the, these random variables, the exponential random variables, parameter lambda, are used to model waiting times, like the time you wait for a bus, the time you wait for uh, the car in front of you to start up a after the light turns from red to green, uh, the time you wait for a, a phone call, uh, the time you wait for lightning to strike, the time uh, someone waits for a customer, the first customer coming to a store, all kinds of things like that, the time you wait for a light bulb to burn out, the time you wait until the first emission of an alpha particle from your smoke detector, or once one is emitted, the time you wait until the next one is emitted. So many, many uh, applications of this. And they have also the same peculiar property here that uh, geometric random variable had. And that is If you're interpreting this in terms of light bulbs, and x is the time when the light bulb burns out, you put the light bulb in, now you keep track of how long it's been burning. When it, the first moment it burn, burns out, that's the value of capital X. It says that the, this is the event that the light bulb has not burned out by time t. It's still, it, when it burns out, is later than t. What's the probability that it lasts longer than s plus t moments, given that it's lasted T moments. It says that it's the probability that it lasts at least S moments. In other words, <coughs> it forgets that it's been burning for T time units already, and its probabilistic behavior in the future is though, as though you just put it in. Let's check to see that this is true. I mean, that this equation is true. Um, I don't know that it's definitely true about light bulbs. Uh, if it is true about light bulbs, I think lambda is pretty big. From my experience at home, I'm always going to the garage, getting the ladder out, and putting in new light bulbs. So lambda must be large for the light bulbs I'm buying. But let's check this. How can we do this again? We use the definition of conditional probability.
Okay. And now S and T are positive. I didn't say that. But let me say it now. And that means S plus T is bigger than T. And that means that this event has no effect because if X is bigger than S plus T, it's automatically bigger than T. And now do we know how to compute the numerator and denominator? Well, what, what random variable this is, is this? This is the exponential. And uh, here it is. Probably an exponential is bigger than this value. It would be e to the minus lambda times that value. Okay. So what's x in the numerator? It's s plus t. And here it's e to the minus lambda t. And that's e to the minus lambda s, which is, in fact, the probability capital X is bigger than s. So this is sort of a renewal property. Uh, if something's been going on for t time units and nothing's happened yet, the probability you have to wait s more time units is the same as if you just started your wait for the event at time zero and had to wait s time units. Okay. A, pro a random variable closely related to um, exponential is called the um, gamma. Let me first introduce the gamma function. is an interesting function. If you think functions can be interesting, then this is one of them. And this is for alpha. We'll define this for alpha bigger than 0. Because when alpha is 0, you have a 1 over x here. And near the origin, that would not have a finite integral. But as long as alpha is bigger than 0, this is fine. Um, you can integrate this by parts. Let me get rid of my sign there. OK. That would say that gamma of alpha is what? U times V. Evaluated between 0 and infinity. Minus the integral from 0 to infinity, V du. Well, the V has a minus sign. Here's a minus sign. It becomes plus e to the minus x. That's the V. Du is alpha minus 1. I can put that out in the alpha minus 1 out in front, and then I get x to the alpha minus 2. The first thing here is what? At infinity, it's 0 because of this guy. At 0, it's 0 because of this guy. So this term is 0. So we get alpha minus 2 integral from 0 to infinity, x to the, I'm going to write alpha minus 2 in a perverse way. Well, maybe weird. Let me take that. alpha minus 1 minus 1. Because why? Look at the form of the gamma function. You have a number minus 1 and an exponent with x for x, right? What do we have here? A number minus 1 in the exponent for x. So what is this integral here? That's gamma at 
alpha minus 1. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. This is, this is al I don't know how I got to alpha minus 2 there. It's alpha minus 1 here. That was alpha minus 1, alpha minus 1. So what does this say? I can erase this now, right? <laughs> and what's gamma of 1? When alpha is 1, there's no power of x here. It's just the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus x dx. And what's that? Well, if we look back to the uh, exponential random variable, that's the integral of the density of the exponential with parameter lambda equal 1, and that has to be 1. And I think you all know how to do this integral. It's minus e to the minus x, right, from 0 to infinity. Gamma of 1 is 1. So these two together imply that gamma of an integer n is what? n minus 1 factorial. So this is an integral way of representing the factorial functions. Why is that? Why is this? Why is this follow from these two things? Put n here. What do we get? n minus 1 times gamma at n minus 1. Now we repeat this with gamma of n minus 1. We get gamma of n minus 1 is n minus 2 times gamma of n minus 2. And we keep going down until we get to 1, and gamma of 1 is 1. Okay. So this says that if I put n here, this thing would be n minus 1 factorial. Okay. One last uh, little variation on that. Let's try to compute this before the break. Now we know how to compute this if lambda is 1. So that suggests what operation here? What should we do? We should try to get the variable of integration here. We should change variables. If lambda is 1, we know this is gamma of alpha. So let's put y equal to lambda x. What's dy in that case? It's lambda dx. Okay. How would this change of variable affect the limits of integration? When x is 0, what's y? 0. When x is infinity, y is infinity. So that doesn't change. We get our e to the minus y here. That's good. For dx, we put in lambda to the minus 1 dy. And now for x, we put in y over lambda. For x, we put y over lambda. We have to put y over lambda here. We get y to the alpha minus 1. What power of lambda would we get? It's y over lambda, so we get lambda to the 1 minus alpha, right? Now I erase this. Um, and this gives lambda to the minus alpha. And what's the What's this integral then? That's gamma of alpha. Okay. So this is equal to gamma of alpha over lambda to the alpha. All right? And that says that the following is a density.
just means it's non-negative and integrates to 1. And when we come back, we'll talk about the random variables with that density. Those are called gamma random variables. And these model things where you have to wait for successive, uh, you have successive waiting times. Like maybe you wait till five light bulbs burn out. You put in a light bulb, wait till it burns out. Put in another one that's identical, wait till it burns out. Third one, wait till it burns out. Fourth one, wait till it burns out. Fifth one, when the fifth one burns out, that would be a gamma random variable. Or I mentioned waiting at a traffic light. The light turns red to green. You're the fifth car back. The waiting time for the first car to take off is probably exponential. After that, the second one takes off another exponential. The third one takes off an exponential. Some of these exponential random variables is a gamma random variable. So a lot of waiting time problems are modeled using gamma random variables. So let's take a break, come back in about 10 minutes. Okay, so uh, let me finish up the gamma random variable here. gamma random variable if its density is given by that. And we'll work extensively with gamma later. I think that we already mentioned the uniform distribution. Uh, let me finish, let me also mention x is a normal random variable. distribution function for x. Let's give my f. That means its density is this constant times that function. Yeah? Um, that thing that looks like sigma squared is just the symbol, right? It's not... It's a, it's a number. It's a number, it's yeah. It's a positive number. But it's not the number squared, that's the whole symbol. It looks like uh, no, it's a number squared. It's a sigma. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, and then it's squared, yeah. It's a sigma. Yeah. yeah, it's a sigma to the power 2. But they always, they usually go together. Uh, well, they go together here and here, but then sigma is called the standard deviation. And the graph of this function, the density then, this statement is equivalent to saying the density of x is 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. That's good for all x. Okay. This is the famous bell-shaped curve. Mu is here. The graph of this function looks like this. It's symmetric with respect to mu. I put that mu. Mu is zero, then it's centered over here. I have here a uh, 10 mark note, which used to be the currency in Germany before the EU. And there's a picture on here of uh, Gauss. How do you like that country where they put mathematicians on the on the currency? That's a great country. <laughs> he was a surveyor, so they have a surveying tool on the back. He was also the one who introduced that density. 
And so there's a graph of it here on the 10 mark note. I'll pass it around. See, there it is on the front. I'm waiting for the day when they have some, maybe Gibbs was a great uh, math American mathematician and he did some things in statistical mechanics. Maybe they'll put some, something on a $100 bill someday. If you ever run for president, maybe that'll be a great idea. You can. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's sort of a category of, uh, or a catalog, I should say, of uh, random variables uh, of, with various distributions. Um, a lot of times we do manipulations on random variables because we don't like the ones we started with, so we try to transform them in some way. Uh, here, or uh, we do it for simulation purposes. Uh, there are tables that give um, a list of independent uh, copies of uh, uniformly distributed random variables. So there will be just tables of numbers. You just, uh, there's a number, it's picked at random between 0 and 1. The next one is picked, another one picked at random between 0 and 1. You can use these to uh, give independent uh, copies of random variables with other distributions. So we take functions of random variables for a couple of reasons. Okay, so we'll start with a random variable that has a given distribution function capital F. It could be any one of the ones we've written down before. And then we take a function of that random variable. And it, let's say that it's an increasing function, though uh, a decreasing function would also work, but I want the function to be one to one. So maybe I should say strictly here, so that G is one to one. Makes it simpler. So it's either strictly increasing or it could be strictly decreasing. And then we take g of x. And what's the distribution function of g of x? So that's another random variable. A function of a random variable is a random variable. And what's the distribution function of a random variable defined by? It's just that. It's the probability that that random variable is smaller and equal to little x. It's this function of little x. Let's try to co <coughs> compute that in terms of capital F. What is capital F? Capital F is the probability that capital X is less than equal to little x. Can we express this in terms of capital X is less than or equal to something? G is strictly increasing, so it's one to one, so it has an inverse. It has an inverse. And the inverse would be increasing or decreasing? If G is increasing, what about its inverse? It's increasing also. So if I apply G inverse to both sides, if this number is less than or equal to that one, if I, what about G inverse of this number? It would be less than or equal to G inverse of that number. In other words, G inverse would, would preserve this order if it's strictly 
increasing. If I apply G inverse to here, what do I get? Capital X. And then that would be less than or equal to G inverse of little x, right? But this is the function capital F evaluated here. Okay, so that would be the distribution function for g of x, f at g inverse of x. Let's do an example. Let's suppose x is uniformly distributed on the interval from 0 to 1. Okay. When I say what is the distribution of a random variable, that means what is the distribution function? So you should write down the probability that g of x is less or equal to little x and then try to compute that. Okay. So let's remind ourselves what it, this means, uh, that capital X is uniformly distributed on the interval from 0 to 1. This means That's the graph of capital F. That's what it means to be uniformly distributed. It means its distribution function is this. That's the, uh, that means you're picking a point at random from the interval from 0 to 1, and there's no bias for any particular place in the interval. It's as likely to come from one side as from the other. OK, so. Let's try to compute the distribution function for g of capital X, where that's g. Oh, and by the way, um, maybe I should say what would happen if g is decreasing. What would change here? G inverse would then be decreasing, so this would be reversed. And that would be 1 minus f of g inverse of x. Okay. 
Okay, I, I just want to add that. So is this function increasing? X goes from where to where here. We're interested in cap values of capital X between 0 and 1. So we're looking at X between 0 and 1 here. Is this function increasing? Well, what about minus X? Increasing or decreasing? The function L of X equal minus X. Is that increasing or decreasing? Look at the line Y equal minus X. What does that do? It goes down, right? What about 1 minus X? Increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. What about the log of 1 minus X? Logs an increasing function. Increasing function of a decreasing function would be, well, take derivatives. Maybe we could just take the derivative of this. What's the derivative? Yeah, and now you have a minus sign here. And when you take the derivative of this part, you get a minus sign also. So they would cancel giving something positive. So this is an increasing function. Okay, This is increasing. So we can apply that formula there. And what's the uh, inverse here? How do you find inverses? Uh, you just solve for x here, right? So let's multiply by minus lambda. Okay, so there's g inverse. So this would be the probability capital X is less than or equal to G inverse of, that's G inverse of Y. G inverse of X. And G inverse of X is 1 minus E to the minus lambda X. And now where is this number? 1 minus this thing. X is, X is going to be bigger than or equal to 0 here. This number is between 0 and 1. So it falls in here. So this is just capital F, this capital F evaluated at 1 minus e to the minus lambda x. What would that be? I'm sorry, you can't read that, can you? Let me just say, if this is y, What's f of y? What's the height of the, that function at y? It's y, right? So if we put this in here, what's f at this value? It's that value. Okay. What distribution function is that? That was the exponential. So if I start with a uniform random variable, on the interval from 0 to 1, and I take this function of it, I get an exponential random variable. So I just mentioned that there are tables of uh, independent copies of, or independent samples of uniform random variables. How could you get independent samples of exponential random variables from that? Just apply this function to them. And that'll give you, a, that'll generate a list of independent random variables, or samples of independent random variables that have exponential distribution. Okay, so this transforms random variables with one distribution to random variables with a, another one. Okay. Let's do another example. Did I write this symbol here? You'll see this a lot. It's 
Suppose x is a, has a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared. And let's say y is equal to ax plus b. What's the distribution of y? So what does it mean when you're asked, what is the distribution of y? It means you should try to figure out what the distribution function is. That is, you should write down the probability that y is less than or equal to little x and see if you can compute it. So you're being asked What is this? Okay. Well, how do you start? Well, this is given in some in terms of something that's known. What? That? And now we could just subtract B from both sides. These two inequalities are equivalent. Now the next step might require assuming A is either positive or negative. Which do you prefer? Pos OK, let's take positive. That's a good outlook. Let's say if A is positive, we divide both sides by A. If A was negative, what would happen? We would just reverse inequality, right? Because then, but the thing, the point is that this inequality is equivalent to that. So this event and this event are the same. That means the probabilities remain the same. Okay. Now we know what that is. That's 1 over square root 2 pi sigma squared integral from minus infinity to x minus a over b e to the minus uh, y minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. Now you might think, wow, how can I ever remember all that? Well, this is gonna, you're going to see this so often that you'll wake up in the middle of the night and it'll be the last thing you were dreaming about before you woke up. OK, so that's the distribution function of y. What's the density of y? The density of a distribution function is its derivative. So let's take the derivative. The density of y How do you differentiate an integral, especially if you have an integral from minus infinity to, let's say, h of x, uh, little f of y dy? What's the derivative of this with respect to x? Remember how that goes? It's f at h of x times h prime of x. Yeah? You're right. Thank you. I told you about my vertical version of, right? <laughs> That's happening again. OK, so that's the h of x. So we just evaluate the density at h and then times h prime. H of x is x minus b over a. So what's h prime? If that's h, x minus b over a, h prime would be 1 over a, right? I'm going to put a little cap, little y here. I 
evaluate here. And I don't like that all that well, because it looks a little complicated, doesn't it? So let's tr try to simplify it a bit. I'm going to put the A inside here. And that means it becomes a squared. And then because I don't have enough room to write high, I'm going to write x instead of e2. I think you know that notation, right? And then uh, up here, Let's see, I'm combining these two guys, and this one's a fraction, and if I'm going to add two things, I should have a common denominator, so the denominator should be a, so this becomes mu a over a, and then I'll have something over a in here, right? But it's squared. So where could we put that? We could put it down here, right? We can put the a squared down here. And then what would be left up here? Well, this doesn't have to be changed. You get the x minus b, but then what's left here? a mu. I'm going to write this as a mu over a. I combine this, I get x minus b minus a mu. I'm going to write it this way. OK? Is everybody OK with that? No objections? You see why? OK. So what do we have? Yeah, it's normal with what, what's the new mu? This is normal density. This becomes a mu, b plus a mu. And the new variance becomes, the new sigma squared becomes sigma, a squared. sigma squared a squared. Okay. So if we start with uh, something with normal mean mu variance sigma squared, can we get by this transformation, uh, which I erased? Can we get to a normal with mean 0 and variance 1? We took ax plus b and we got to this. Can we arrive at normal mean 0 variance 1? Can we get the new mu to be 0 and the new variance to be 1? How could we go from normal mean mu variance sigma squared to normal mean 0 variance 1? Can we do that? All we have to do is solve the equation b plus a mu is 0. Sigma squared a squared equal 1. So what should a squared be? Or what should a be? 1 over, 1 over a. I'm sorry, a should be 1 over sigma. And mu should be, I'm sorry, b should be. Well, minus mu over sigma. Then we go from, a, if we multiply by a and add b, we go from there to there. What about the other way? Can we go backwards? Suppose we start with a normal mean 0 and variance 1. Can we get to a normal 
mean mu variant sigma squared. How do we go from here to here? So that means uh, we start with this as 1, 0, and this is one, 1. That means we'd wind up with 1 over square root 2 pi a squared exponential. We'd wind up with what? x minus, this is 0, so x minus b squared over 2a squared. Now how can we get mu here and sigma here? Just take b equal mu and a equal to sigma. That is, if x is I'll usually write it this way. If x is can't do it right, normal with mean 0 and variance 1, then mu x, I'm sorry, sigma x plus mu is normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. This is how you go from a normal with mean 0 and variance 1 to a normal with mean mu and variance sigma squared. So this is handy. Because in a lot of statistical tests, like uh, here's a dream job, uh, you get your degree in math and statistics, and you're hired by, uh, I don't know, uh, who owns M&Ms? I forget, some come. Maybe Nestle's, I don't know. Or maybe you're hired by Nestle's, and they make uh, chocolate drops, right? These uh, chocolate chips. Chocolate chips don't all have the same weight. Uh, the weight of a chocolate chip is a random variable. And it's got a normal distribution with some mean mu and some variance sigma squared, and you're supposed to find out what it is. You use things like this where you try to <coughs> go from normal with mean 0 and variance 1 to whatever this mean weight and variance for the chocolate chip is. So you want to use this transformation. Uh, <coughs> Also, there are tables for normal random variables with mean 0 and variance 1. In fact, in the back of the book, there's a table for distribution function of normal with mean 0 and variance 1. So that is, uh, in the back of the book, you'll find values for this function of x for a lot of different x's. And it should be table which um, probably, yeah, table 2. Um, in my older version, well, it's appendix B table 2. So they will have a bunch of numbers in here. And right here is 0.4, and up here is 0 0.04. So if I go across here to 0.44, this number is a probability that a normal random variable with mean 0 and variance 1 is less than or equal to 0 0.6700. I'm sorry, the probability of random variable with mean 0 and variance 1 is less than or equal to 0 0.44 is 0 0.6700. Now, if I want to know a similar probability for this kind of random variable, I apply this transformation to normal random variable with mean 0 and variance 1, and I get one with mean 0 and variance mu squared. Or I might go backwards. So this helps you to read off uh, distrib distribution function for this kind of random variable from a uh, distribution function for the normal with mean 0 and variance 1. And uh, later on in the statistical testing part of the course, we'll be doing that kind of thing a lot. OK, so that's. Uh, the end of chapter two. Now let's start chapter three on uh, joint distributions. A lot of times uh, comparisons are made. For example, my oldest son is uh, 
He has uh, shoe size three sizes bigger than mine, size 14. And so that's a random variable. My shoe size is a random variable. Uh, you might look at the shoe size of a father and the shoe size of his son. These will be two random variables. Will they be related somehow? Would you expect, a, I don't know, a Yao Ming, for example, to have a son with a size nine shoe? Probably not, right? <laughs> but Yao Ming's son's shoe size would be related to his shoe size. Or uh, to go the other way, who knows who Messi is? Who is he? Soccer, soccer player, yeah. He's a soccer player for, he's probably the best soccer player in the world. And uh, in fact, uh, his team uh, spotted him when he was a young boy. Uh, he was very highly skilled, but he was really small. So in fact, they gave him growth hormones. <laughs> but he's still small. But you would expect his son to have small shoe size, right? So these are examples of pairs of random variables. Shoe size of a father, shoe size of a son, or height of a father, height of a son which are uh, correlated. They have some kind of joint characteristics, joint distribution. So chapter three is on jointly distributed random variables. And there are many examples of uh, random variables that come in pairs that are jointly distributed. So let's do a couple of um, maybe very simple examples that involve uh, what we've done already. Let's say we take uh, We select a number at random from 0, 1. Then we perform n independent Bernoulli trials. probability u of success. Is it probably that we have fewer than no no more than k successes, and that the u we picked is less than equal to the u? This is called the joint distribution of x and u. So we perform some operation, some experiment first namely picking a number at random. That becomes our probability of success. And then with that probability of success, we generate a random variable, which is the number of successes in independent Bernoulli trials with that probability of success each time. Now, this is a little ambitious to do uh, first time. Let's try something a little easier. Let's try um, the following. Let's say. Um, you'll be in favor of trying an easier computation first. Let's say that uh, the probability that u is uh, a 4.5 
fourth is equal to the probability that u is three fourths is one half. So we have a random variable that takes two values, one fourth or three fourths, uh, with equal probability. So how could you do that? Well, you toss a coin. If it comes up heads, you set u equal to fourth. If it comes up tails, you set u equal to three fourths. Okay. Now let's try this. Uh, we could look at now, in fact, the PMF. This would be the joint PMF. Okay. Well, what kind of values of J do we have to consider here? Just this one and this one. So let's start with this one. So what do we have here? Um, maybe we should write this in terms of conditional probabilities. It would look like that, right? Now given that u is a fourth, what kind of distribution does x have? It's binomial. Yeah, go ahead. Um, wouldn't that be? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. There it is again. Thanks. Thank you. So, given u as a fourth, what distribution does x have? Over here it says that it would be, we do the same kind of thing. It's binomial with parameter one fourth binomial with parameter one-fourth. So this would be n choose k, uh, one-fourth to the k, three-fourths to the n minus k, times a half. The half coming from here. And uh, above it here I'll write the probability x is equal to k and u is 3 fourths would be what? Do the same thing. That's the probability x is equal to k given u is 3 fourths times the probability u is 3 fourths, which would be, this is now binomial with parameters n and p equal 3 fourths. So it'd be n choose k, 3 fourths to the k, 1 minus 3 fourths is 1 fourth to the n minus k times a half. So generally we say xy of random variables has a joint distribution function capital F if the probability of capital X is less than or equal to little x, capital Y is less than or equal to y is f of xy. Okay, so this would look like this. Here's 
x, here would be y. This is the point x, y. That probability here is the probability that the pair x, y falls in that region. Okay. case of continuous random variables, the pair xy has joint density little f if the probability you lie in a region like this can be gotten by integrating a function little f. So let me just give one last example of, of a density, and we'll stop. Okay, so do you know what this means, indicator of uh, something? This means the function that is 1 if this condition is satisfied, and it's 0 if it's not. So this density is 1 times this number when x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to r squared, and it's 0 when x squared plus y squared is bigger than r squared. So where is this, in words, where is this function different from 0? Inside this circle centered at the origin of radius r. And what's its value on that circle? It's 1 over the area of this circle. Okay. A pair of random variables with this joint density is said to be selected at random from the, from the disk of radius r, center of the origin. This is uniformly distributed on the disk of, or circle of radius r, center of the origin. Okay. And we'll do more with that later. Okay, thanks.